Well, I'm here for one reason only. I'm the last survivor of that famous debate. My only qualification is that I'm now very old, and look how long it took me to do that. <laughs> the one thing I do think of now is I am very disappointed that Eric Abrahams did not live long enough to be here. Uh, he was a very good and amiable man indeed, and I would really have liked to see him again. I'm very sorry that he didn't quite live long enough. So I think there should be a tribute to Abe's, as we knew him, Eric Abrahams. Now, I've been asked, do I still hold to the views that I expressed in opposing Malcolm X during the debate? And the answer is, yes, I do. And there are certain things that need to be said. The first is, I spoke before Malcolm X had spoken, and I did not refer to the same issues that he spoke about. I didn't refer to him, and I didn't refer to the things that were obviously most important to him. As far as I was concerned, it was my task to oppose a proposition. Extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Moderation in the defense of justice is no virtue. And for me, this was at the time when Barry Goldwater had made that statement. It was also at the time when I had started to visit Eastern Europe. And this was still during the time of the Soviet Empire. And I was meeting Czechs, Estonians, other people who really did know what continued uh, colonial oppression meant. And I still go back there. They keep asking me back. I'm going back in a couple of months back to the Czech Republic uh, to lecture. So <laughs> what I saw there, not now, where well, it's very pleasant to go back to the Czech Republic. But what I saw in Soviet times was a complete absence of liberty and a complete absence of justice. And I felt strongly about it. I became and have remained a very strong opponent of that kind of political order. But nonetheless, I disagreed with Goldwater, who used the phrase. I simply took the view that if you use extremism to try and put things right, you might end up with World War III. In other words, what I was saying was, even if things are very bad, extremism may well make them worse. That is quite often what happens when people take strong action. They end up, because they haven't thought it through, with a situation that is worse than what was there before. And I simply worked quietly away with a man called Alexander Stromas, who was a refugee from Moscow, simply to undermine the system in small ways. I did not want to take any extreme action, even against something that I thought was evil. That was where I was coming from. I did not talk about the same issues, but I was talking about issues that were important to several hundred million people. And that was at the back of my mind during the debate, and I have not changed my mind about anything. And the memory I have later is going with Thomas, by purely by chance, we happened to be in Bulgaria, in Sofia, on the day when the regime collapsed. And I can still remember being with the crowds in the street in Sofia, and we were watching the high officials coming out of their offices and people shouting abuse at them with impunity. And we joined in, and some of them understood English, and they were not happy. But there was no violence, there was no extremism. 
And that was the kind of revolution that I thought one ought to have, um, one ought to aim for. I don't want to see an extreme end to such a system. And my own feeling is that the way things ended and the collapse of that system, it was also a precursor for the bloodless ending of apartheid. I think one very much influenced the other. Now, as far as Malcolm X was concerned, um, he and I got on very well. I spent the evening with him after the debate. I felt he'd made a good speech, and I liked him, and we exchanged opinions afterwards in a perfectly moderate way. But in certain ways, I felt he was wrong, and my subsequent experiences confirmed it. One was in his putting together <clears throat> all the people in the world who weren't white, as if somehow they all had something in common. I felt that was profoundly mistaken, that people exist in their own spheres and they are very, very different indeed. And I saw this particularly when I subsequently went to East Africa. I was asked to go there to look into the situation of the Asian minority in East Africa. And what I saw there was what we have seen in Europe as anti-Semitism. And it doesn't really matter what color you are, you can get racial hatred. You can get it between white and white, as in Eastern Europe, as in Germany, or you can get it as here between people who are black and people who are brown. I have rarely seen so much hatred. And I recorded it, and you can go to the sound archive in the British Library, you can find the interview material I brought back. And as a result of that, I was given uh, a visiting, I was made a visiting scholar at a series of Indian universities. And it was here that I came to the conclusion he was wrong on a second point. I went to India, it was 73, 74, and I was at a series of universities there, and it was just after the liberation of Bangladesh. And one of the things that I was convinced of, and I was also working there uh, with the Indian Secular Society, was that whatever Islam does, it doesn't do much for liberty, and it doesn't do much for justice. That was what I learned in India, and particularly after the behavior in Bangladesh of the Pakistani army. And I thought to myself, uh-uh, no way. The other thing I can remember is being in Gujarat and meeting some African slaves, which was a very strange experience. One of my colleagues simply said to me, would you like to come and see an African village? And I said, yeah, sure, let's go. So we went to the coast, and there was a village which was exactly like the villages I'd seen in Africa, exactly like. And so he, interpreting, because they only spoke Gujarati, we asked them about things. What was clear was they had been taken there across the Indian Ocean as slaves and simply dumped down there and under pressure from the British rulers of India, they had to let them go, but they were still there. And then I thought, well, what happened with the slave trade in the Indian Ocean? How did it start, and why did it stop? The first thing that was quite clear to me was that it had been a Muslim slave trade. The second thing that was clear to me is they would not have stopped it if they had not been forced to stop it. It would have continued right down to the present day. So that's the second, in retrospect, way in which I think he was wrong. But it does not mean that I don't think that he was a remarkable man. Just on the basis of listening to him in a debate and spending an evening with him, I can assure you he was indeed a remarkable man. Thank you.